Hello and welcome everyone to the August edition of the Australian Microsoft 365 Adoption User Group. Uh, we are all got some lots of people still coming in, lots of unverified people. So I'm going to get a lot of binging going on. Apologies for those that will be getting the binging as well. But uh, good to be here. It's been uh, another really big month with an awful lot that's actually been happening. Um, I'd like to just go through a few core things in terms of getting started. I have pinned in the chat for you. The presentation is available online for you to be able to get access to. Um, so it's there and I will be putting in it very soon. The slides that will be up for our speakers as well. The recording is available on the M365 Adoptions, the Microsoft 365 Adoption YouTube channel. So that is actually available <clears throat> for you online. I just ask that in the session, um, if you aren't a speaker, if maybe you could put yourself on mute. The session is recorded and it, as I said, it will go up on the um, a YouTube channel. I will post out both in chat, I'll say when it's live. I'll also tell you online when it's live as well as. A, but if we can please keep ourselves on mute for the recording, that would be great. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, please feel free to type it into chat for us, ask questions along the way. We'll leave ourselves a little bit of time at the end of each sort of speaker sessions and other sessions to um, um, ask questions if you want to raise your hand and come off mute. If you think your question's a little bit more complicated or it's been missed in the chat, I'll try and keep up to speed for our speakers there. So. If you do wish to, then please, you'll raise your hand before you come off mute so that um, the speakers can answer some questions. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting from today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders peoples who's joined us. I ask that we all be open and welcoming, welcoming to different viewpoints, that we be kind and considerate, friendly, use appropriate gifts along the way. We've seen some interesting one over the eight and a half odd years that I've been running these user groups. So I just ask and across fingers this time around, we won't have a troll like last month. School holidays have gone back, so we should we, we cross fingers won't have that this time around. Um, but I want to thank everyone that was in the user group last month that actually helped to manage manage them. The recording doesn't have that in it, so I have managed to pull a lot of it out if you are looking at the recording on YouTube. Okay. I am Kirsty McGrath. If you haven't been on before, I'm seeing a lot of very familiar places, but there's also some that are new. I am an adoption consultant and an employee experience. I'm a trainer. Uh, I, you know, I'm the director of On Point Solutions, of which we're a training, um, change, comms, analysis organization, and I've been running these user groups. Now, what have I been up to? I always start with a little bit of where have I been, what have I been doing? Yes, I'm doing cakes, and I've got a whole heap more coming up. Up, so you get to see those next month. Too many to count, including wedding cakes. Um, I made a bouquet of cupcakes and I've been doing some, um, there's Japanese sweets. They're like this jelly, very soft jelly, and they get a bit of a crisp outside and they were really lovely and I turned a bit into jewellery and fun stuff at a, at a, uh, a class. Nah, the really exciting part is, I've talked to you before about the um, the new Copilot laptop, but I got my own. So I'm just like, I'm rather excited. I've got a few just can't see it's so pretty it's so pretty so i managed because you can't actually get the sapphire keyboard in australia at the moment may have got it shipped down from tucson arizona Tell us <laughs> just so that i could have it i could ask that whoever's not on mute if maybe you could go on mute please thank you so rather excited to have my new laptop and uh, we just had only last week, was it to be last week, I'm losing track of my of my days, um, I was at the Digital Workplace Conference and Debbie's on the call and thank you yeah. Debbie for you and your team and the fabulous work that you do with the Digital Workplace Conference and it was so great to see so many of my user group attendees actually coming along and spending some time you know getting understanding kind of what's what's happening and what's sort of moving forward in this space because there were certainly some really great topics so I was presenting and I was talking about you know lots of very um, um, lots of great components in in this I was showing I was one of the rare few with a surface device with me so there was lots of photos 
photos and demos going on along the way. So I had a bit of fun there. Um, just a couple of photos. So as you'll see some familiar faces, you're probably here in the user group. Uh, I've kind of put up, you know, a few different few different pieces. So it was it was just. I love seeing the community come together. I love getting reinvigorated by you all and being around you. Uh, so I uh, certainly had a lot of fun. Now, this one is a little bit different. What I've done is I was on my user group and I was going, how many people have actually been RSVPing who've been around for a little while? Mel, I want to thank you for all of your RSVPs and John from Melbourne. So we've got Sydney and the Melbourne user group. You might be from anywhere in the world, um, but these are my top 20 RSVPs and I know I see your faces all the time um, and I do appreciate the fact that you come back again and again. So kudos to you. Thank you. Now, guest speaker kicking in. I would like to invite and say thank you to Elizabeth and Lisa who've actually joined us from Microsoft. I had the um, that undeniable privilege of meeting both of them through the Copilot Surface launch that I was a part of that you saw photos from a little while ago on the 18th. And I, um, I was having a good chat with them both and going, you know, how are you using AI in your communication space? What does that actually look like for you guys? and got into a bit of a conversation around what that might look like. So um, Lisa is a communication manager at Microsoft ANZ and Liz is the head of communications at Microsoft ANZ. They do focus mainly on the external kind of co communications as part of the business. So they're not kind of focused so much on the internal and the internal communication, but we're still looking at how we use Copilot uh, to be able to build comms. So a lot of times we are doing you know, external communications in any role. Do you know if you're sending an email out, guess what? You're sending out external communications. <laughs> so with all of that, I am going to hand over to the team and say thank you very much for joining us. And I'll let you start presenting your screen. I'll stop sharing mine and let's move over for you guys. Thanks, good, Christy. Just give me one second to get myself set up here. And oh, just good. Give, give me a thumbs up when you can see the slides. We can see the sides. Excellent. Um, so thank you so much for that kind introduction, Kirsty. Um, as Kirsty said, so I'm Liz Green. Um, I lead the comms function for Microsoft across Australia and New Zealand um, and have had the huge, huge um, kind of fortune to do that for almost seven years. I think my seventh anniversary is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, as Kirsty mentioned, we actually caught up. We held a media event about six or eight weeks ago now um, for the launch of the Copilot Plus PC which is where we met Kirsty, and we were just chatting through some of the ways that we're using AI as she mentioned um, and so look at the purpose of today I am joined as Kirsty said by Lisa and my team um, Lisa is definitely the power user when it comes to AI um, within the comms function at Microsoft ANZ so she's going to do a few demos um, just to talk through how she's using some of our products day to day um, but before maybe we get there I was just going to take you through just literally a handful of slides just to kind of position it a little bit around, I guess, how we're thinking about adopting AI and how we are adopting AI um, within the comms function globally at Microsoft, if that sounds good. Um, the one thing I will say is I'm not at all technical. Um, if you've got any comms questions, very happy to answer them. But I know there's tons of other Microsofties on the line as well as Kirsty. So um, so please just feel free to ask any questions as we go in, and we'll do our best to, um, to answer them. Um, so just very quickly, um, we always like to kind of refer to ourselves a little bit as customer zero at Microsoft. Um, I know we sometimes use that horrible term eating our own dog food, but, you know, for the last kind of 12 to 18 months since we first started introducing Copilot tools, um, we've very much been on a journey within the communications function um, to just really kind of embed our tools within the function and, and kind of in the work that we do day to day. 
I would say there's kind of two areas that we're focused on as a comms function globally. Um, and we're very fortunate to have a guy called Steve Clayton, who's actually kind of leading our strategy. Um, one is really around how do we embed those tools in what we do day to day and really kind of looking at processes within the comms function um, where we can actually use our AI tools. Um, in addition to that, we all also are building a couple of tools. There's two specific areas that we're focused on um, and we're hoping to get our hands on these new applications in the next few months. Um, one is around measurement and reporting. Um, it's, it's quite a hard area for us sometimes from an external comms point of view to really measure um, the impact that we're having and so very excited about a joint partnership that we're doing with a, a company called Meltwater um, who's, who are like a media analysis and reporting company. Um, to build a new measurement tool um, which will live in Teams um, using AI, obviously. Um, and then we're also building what we call a communications co-pilot, um, which is really kind of like a portal um, for communicators, just kind of the typical scenarios that we would work through day to day. And um, and again, that's going to be integrated into Teams, so that should be coming in Q2. So I'll talk a little bit about those later. Um, but before I go there, um, and you probably all know this way better than I do. Um, I think when it comes to AI adoption, what we're definitely finding is that, you know, it takes time to form a habit. Um, and it's something that we need to do in terms of actually embedding it, as I said, into kind of how we do business and, and kind of our day to day um, activities. Um, these are just some stats from our recent Work Trends Index that was released in May. Um, but it essentially says that, you know, it probably takes around 11 weeks to form a habit. Um, and I would definitely say from my own experience, I, I started using our co-pilot tools just um, under 12 months ago. Um, I think that's definitely true. Obviously, the more you use these tools, the more you can um, gain and the more you learn, obviously, as you go as well. Um, one thing that we've all been encouraged to do within the comms function is actually kind of think about, you know, a typical day in the life of Liz Green or typical day in the life of a communicator um, and where, you know, at different points in the day you can actually incorporate um, our AI tools in what you do. Um, and so this is a little exercise I did and, and all of my team have done over the last little while. Um, just around, you know, a typical day, obviously we work um, from a, for a US company and so we're often waking up to very full inboxes. Um, and so just using Copilot and Teams just to kind of get a quick summary of maybe what's happened um, over the last um, kind of seven or eight hours since you, you may have last looked at your email um, or your Teams is definitely one of the ways in which I tend to start my day. Um, also just catching up on things like meetings that may have happened um, through the night in particular if there's any actions out of meetings um, for yourself. Um, we obviously are working very much in the world of media relations, as Kirsty mentioned. Um, so I'm using Copilot a lot just to kind of stay across, you know, what's happening in the world of AI news, for example. I've, I feel like I've worked in communications for 25 plus years, but the rate of change and the number of kind of big news announcements that are happening now on an almost daily basis, it's hard sometimes to kind of keep track. Um, so I'm definitely using um, Copilot just to kind of stay across what's happening from a news perspective. Um, and then just using it as well. I don't tend to personally use it a lot for writing. It's just a personal thing. I find the process of writing is, is how I form thoughts. Um, but what I do use it for often is things like actually reviewing content, you know, making sure that the key messages we're trying to land are getting through um, and that we're kind of hitting the mark. So I tend to use it as a, from, a, from a review perspective rather than writing, um, but I know plenty of others and um, I'm not sure if Lisa's going to show an example or not, but I know plenty of other people who do use it for writing. Um, and then ideation is probably one of the other areas that I'm increasingly using it as well. Um, we've, we've all kind of suffered from the blank, the blank page and sometimes I've been doing this job for a while, just coming up with new ideas for stories, etc. Um, sometimes you just need a bit of impetus. Um, and so I'm definitely using um, our co-pilot tools a lot for ideation. Um, a couple of other areas that we're looking at is just really kind of taking a process within our comms function. 
Um, and just thinking about some of the ways that you can incorporate AI into those processes. Um, so this example here, and I won't go into it in detail, is around conducting a media interview, something that we do on an almost daily basis. And just thinking through the various steps that kind of lead up to um, a media interview. I think actually our managing director is on the phone with a journalist from the Financial Review at the moment. Um, and as you can imagine, those are things that maybe take a week or two to plan. Um, but, you know, in the process of setting up an interview, you know, you, you're kind of thinking through, you know, ultimately, who's the audience I'm trying to reach and therefore, you know, who is the journalist I'm going to target or the publication, um, you know, actually doing some research about the journalist. What is it that they're interested in? What are they writing about? Um, thinking through uh, for a particular announcement, what are the kind of typical questions that somebody may have? Um, because we always kind of try and preempt it and also just help our spokespeople in preparing for a, a media interview just to make sure that they're landing the messages they want to land um, and creating things like briefing documents and FAQ documents, which is something that we do um, on a daily basis. And then something I've been doing quite a lot recently, which I've been I um, find really valuable is then taking a transcript at the end of an interview. And, you know, when you've been doing this job for a long time, you kind of have a gut sense as to where a journalist is likely to kind of write a story and if there's a particular hook they're going to take. But actually using Copilot to kind of take a transcript and, and kind of come back and say what they what Copilot thinks this story is going to be. And it's been extraordinary just to see how accurate it's been. Um, so that's just a kind of typical example of like a process that we do here um, at Microsoft and, and how we use AI. Um, another one is obviously in preparing something like a blog post, um, you know, again, the blank page, generating first drafts, you know, kind of iterating as you go, um, doing research, message testing, etc. Um, we definitely find it a really useful tool just to be able to kind of, as I said, kind of gather your thoughts and, and try and make sure that you're hitting the right messages. Um, but look, with that, um, talk is one thing, but I think it would probably be much more helpful if my colleague Lisa um, could maybe talk through now um, just a few um, demos and examples of how she is using Copilot um, in her role as a comms manager day to day. So with that, Lise, I'm going to hand over to you. I'll just stop sharing, Lisa. Brilliant. Thanks, Liz. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, lovely to meet you. My name is Lisa. I lead consumer communications across ANZ. Um, and as Liz mentioned, um, I've personally been experimenting with AI for over a year now, I think since we launched Bing, Bing Chat, now known as Microsoft Copilot in February of last year. Um, but when it was first introduced, I think like many of you may have felt a little bit of hesitation about how this was going to impact um, your work. But I think over the past few months, I've quickly realized how beneficial it is when it comes to integrating AI into your workflow as communicators um, and really giving you the time back to focus on the creative um, and higher order thinking of your roles. So I do use Copilot pretty much every day um, and I think of it like building a muscle. Um, it requires consistency for you to really um, truly realize its impact. So I'll do a couple of live demos and see how it goes but um, as I'll firstly show an example, and I know we do focus on um, external communications and media relations, but I thought it would be great to show an example I've done recently on the internal comm side of things um, of how I've used Copilot. So this is just an example of, let's say, for I received an email um, and I'm part of the Asians at Microsoft ERG um, and it's, you know, outside of my day job, but these requests do come up and prop up at a bit of a last minute um, rate. So one of my team members asked if I can pull together an email to pull um, to help notify our Asians at Microsoft community to help us shape our FY25 planning. And a little um, fun tip that I love to do is I love using Copilot Windows because it just helps um, create some, um, it just helps me stay focused, but also when you click on the top right, it will um, connect and overlay onto your screen, which I find really useful when I use several different apps or um, different programs. So when I received this email, I was like, okay, I need to put an email together quite quickly. Um, I didn't have much context of what, um, you know what the what the email would be about but for example and i personally like using it for content creation but it's more in the lens of it is a first draft so you i'll show you the before and afters of how i've shifted what copilot's given me versus what was the actual final outcome so when you use copilot windows and as i said having it pinned 
on your screen or your desktop is really helpful. So I would say something like, um, write me an email for the Asians at Microsoft ANZ ERG community to complete a focus survey to help with FY25 planning. And now with live demos, I might have a, I might have a misspelling. So please be patient. Um, the survey includes questions such as initiatives to prioritize, um, feedback on events and level of importance. I'll just say include an email header and a close right with a warm and inviting tone. So that's an example of a prompt that I'll put in when I want to cu curate um, an email. And as you can see here, Copilot's um, drafted me um, not only the email copy, but some suggested, you know, the subject header as well as the close. Now, this is an example where what I do is I will copy and paste it into an OFT, but there is requires a lot of editing involved just to make sure that I um, I have the right messaging and tone in relation to um, the ERG and how I would usually write it. So as an example, I've taken, you know, what was relatively a good first draft um, and I've pretty much translated into an easy of T that aligns to our messaging. Um, and that was really helpful because, um, you know, it just helped me get this job done quite quickly. So that's just one example of um, helping it and what Kirsty said was beautiful in terms of like using it as like a junior copywriter, um, but then obviously adjusting it to, to what you need. Okay, so the next example I'm going to do is a lot of these examples that I'm showing you is co-pilot functionality that everyone should have access to. Um, so in today's purposes of today's demo, I'm going to also show you co-pilot edge, which is something um, I would say is a really useful tool because with Copilot um, in Edge, it's free access to all, um, and it's virtually the same experiences as what you would do on the web version or within the Windows version. Um, but all I would say is the benefit of Copilot in Edge is that it actually captures the context cues of what you're viewing in your browser. So for an example here is let's say I've got this really long keynote from Satya. It's about an hour long um, and I just wanted to understand the summary of um, the keynote. So I would just say um, summarize the transcript of Satya's keynote and include timestamps. So instead of me having to, you know, watch the whole one hour, um, what's the beauty of it is I can ask it to summarize kind of what um, Satya was talking about. So on the right-hand side, you can see that because I'm using Copilot Edge, it's grabbing the context cues of what's on my screen. Um, so what you can see here is that it's giving me a summary of what Satya was talking about. He mentioned things like, you know, the Copilot Plus PCs, um, as well as the key themes um, that were discussed. So for example, if I wanted to understand what his vision of AI was, I would double down um, and listen to what he said. But because again, I work in comms, um, I don't think I need to understand what, you know, the GitHub Copilot extensions are. So it really helps me focus on one of those key talking points. Um, that Sati is talking about. Um, so that's another example of what I've used. Another one is, um, for example, I do a lot of, you know, employee advocacy. So how do I, you know, want to share stories on my LinkedIn or help others do the same? Uh, with Copilot Edge, you've also got a beautiful, you know, um, compose functionality here, which is purely for um, pulling together content. Um, so this is something where, you know, similarly I could do, um, where I can, you know, easily draft content. And this is where you can select, you know, specific tones, formats, as well as length. So I'm just going to do an example where I've got this beautiful own story um, from Taiwan. And, you know, I wanted to share that onto my LinkedIn. So I'll just say, um, write me a LinkedIn post um, to summarize, uh, to share this story. Uh, I'll just keep it casual. I want to do a LinkedIn post and I'll keep it relatively short. So I would just flag that with the Compose feature, um, it's not the same as the Copilot Edge where you'll get the context cues of what's on your screen. Um, when you're using the Compose feature and you need to grab content from a specific story, um, you just need to make sure that you include the link here. 
But as you can see, um, it's given me a LinkedIn copy version, even hashtags and those emojis. Um, but again, this is where I would start as a first draft and obviously curate that more into the voice of how I would post naturally. Um, and then the last, um, the last uh, demo that I'm going to do to showcase is actually Copilot um, in Word. So, like Liz mentioned, we you know take um, we take a, a bit of time to to help prep our spokespeople for media interviews. Um, and more recently, when we launched Copilot Plus PC in Australia, um, this was a really awesome functionality to use Copilot Word to help me list um, a variety of easy and difficult questions that a journalist may ask about a specific product launch. So using Copilot in Word, I've got my trusty Copilot icon on the corner here, and I will just say, write me a um, list of easy and difficult questions a journalist may ask on the Copilot Plus PCs, and I'll say leveraging the talking points from um, I'm just going to use a specific file. So that's my also my other favorite thing is when you use Copilot and Word and using your dash, you can reference talking points or reference other content pieces just to make your output um, more accurate. So I'll give it a moment for it to kind of sift through the document, but I always really enjoy using Copilot as that first step. Um, and I find it especially helpful when, you know, when I'm doing these preparation sessions with my spokespeople, we always want to make time to, you know, do a mock interview. And this is where I find it really helpful to get that. All right. So as you can see, it's drafted up a lot of different questions, um, but this is where it's based on a blog post um, that I put through. So it, there's got a really good mixture of content. Again, this is all publicly um, accessible information. But what I find really useful here is that if, for example, let's say I'll keep it, again, I'll fine tune this um, and start to break it down into what um, you know I would love to test or would love to help um, support my spokespeople on. But again, this is another example is instead of me having to sit here for 30 minutes and think about what the questions could be if you just leverage different types of content it will just help draft it up um, a lot more bigger so that's kind of it from a demo point of view i did blitz through that but i think one key takeaway that i would share with all of you is that i'm not sure what access to copilot you have um, because everyone's you know access is quite different but if you want free access i would recommend to copiling web or copilot and edge to get started on your journey and that's it for me Fantastic. I see that um, uh, Dot has her hand up. Dot, you have a question you'd like to come off mute? Uh, yes, yes. Hi, thank you. And thank you for sharing. Um, I have been using Copilot Edge uh, and, it's, and it's a wonderful tool. I am trying to push our organisation to adopt um, the full version. Um, however, uh, it has been declined at this time, <laughs> um, but I am still pushing for that. However, I have two questions. Um, the uh, terms of spelling in the Australian English, because um, a lot of people would look at, uh, say, an email and say if, you know, a word prioritise is used with a Z with, instead of an E, it's kind of like frowned upon. Um, so it, is there a way to make that seamless? <laughs> At this point, the Australian English has not actually been put out there in Copilot. You look at the different versions of English that are out there, Australian isn't yet. And if you ask it to put it into Australian, yeah. you'll get, yeah, mate, Ocker, yeah. Um, shrimp on the barbie yeah yeah. Stuff. Yeah. So, yeah 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 i tried that and i just i couldn't stop laughing yes yeah <laughs> yeah going. that's it so um, not, not at yeah, this so, point yet right 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 and my second question is i'm a huge advocate for mental health is there anything on copilot that would assist uh particularly in the areas of neurodiversity um on how things are presented That's Sorry. probably a question that's out of my remit. If I, if I, 
or it might, yeah. So, um, I'm okay. So, yeah, there's a couple um, of things yeah. that I know of in terms of the, the neurodiversity, and or a couple of others is having the microphone inside Copilot for them to be able to verbalize if they need to. Maybe they can't type. There's been quite a few features that are actually included in. And if you go to the accessibility site, the Microsoft accessibility site, when it comes to some of the AI and Copilot, they do have lists out of all the various features and functionality that's uh, available there to be able to help and support. Um, I see it's particularly valuable where, you know, English might not be the first language. So we're seeing some great re rights and some support around structure of sentences and the grammatical side of things that's really helping as well. So, you know, there are a lot of cool components that come in, whether it's Copilot or other AI solutions. Um, well, I would add, this is, this is anecdotal, Kirsty, but one other example I've heard a few people reference is just even being able to get kind of like meeting summary notes and action points at the end of a meeting. Um, I've heard a, a number of people who are neurodiverse say that that's been super helpful just because it's just making sure that they've, you know, that maybe they've understood, you know, the key points and, and who's on point for what. Um, having that kind of summarization functionality for Teams meetings is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. They often find that in terms of that's that particular part, it's because it's a, you know, they might be great at listening, but not great at typing or writing and they can only do one thing at a time. So for them to get notes afterwards, they're often relying on someone else because they might struggle. So, you know, we're seeing that in terms of that, that the, the neurospicy, as I know, a lot of my families like to call themselves. <laughs> We've got a few, few neurospicy across it. the family. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, um, yeah, because you go first. Uh, no, no, is there anything else we've got, May, who's also got her hand up? Elizabeth, do you still have some of your presentation to go? I've got like a handful of slides, Kirsty. Okay. So just um, so we'll, we might just do that and then may come back around to your question in a minute, if that's okay. Thank you. Thanks, oh, Kirsty. I will, I've literally got just a few more slides. We've probably whipped through this quite quickly. <laughs> Kirsty, but just give me a second and I'm hopefully going to resume where I left off. I did indeed. Um, so look, the next couple of slides, give me one moment here. I think it's just loading. Um, it's just really kind of where next um, for us. Um, and these are look truthfully tools that we're building, as I mentioned earlier, um, internally um, for use within the Microsoft comms function. Um, I mentioned that measurement is something that we've struggled with in the past. And certainly when we talk to other communicators, this is one that they get quite excited about. Um, but um, we're in the process of um, building a new platform with a company called Meltwater, um, which will be able to just kind of give us, you know, just incredible kind of insights around, um, you know, a particular topic and who's reporting on it and how they're reporting on it. Um, I've seen a few demos and I think it's going to be a really useful tool just to be able to target different audiences and, and really understand um, being, you know, using a lot more data to, to think about who we want to target and how we want to target. Um, and then hopefully get into the nirvana of a bit more foresight as well, um, because, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, we're hoping to look a little bit over the horizon in our roles just to kind of see what where issues are developing. Um, and I think being able to use a tool like this to kind of give us a bit more foresight about what might come next um, is going to be hugely, hugely valuable. So that's something that we are um, very excited about getting our hands on. I've been told I'm going to get access next week. Um, another thing that we're building is what we're calling a communications co-pilot, um, and that is very much being designed for communicators at Microsoft based on what we do every day. And so, um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, it's almost like a portal um, where we will go to be able to kind of do the typical things that we do in our daily work. So things like briefing documents is something that appears, seems like it's the bane of every communicator's life. Um, and that is something that our team are working really hard on so that we can, you know, generate briefing documents. Of course, they're going to need your input and, and everything to finesse. Um, but just being able to get a first draft of things like that can be really helpful. Getting things like the latest FAQs and messaging 
particularly on topics that move so rapidly, um, is also really helpful. And then working in a large organisation like ours with over 200,000 employees, sometimes actually finding the right person to get information from is can take time. You know, often it's based in relationships today, but one of the things I'm excited to get my hands on is within Comms Copilot is just really like being able to find those experts within the business who we've maybe used to speak to a journalist on the past on, say, a topic like quantum computing um, and being able to use this comms co-pilot to do things like that. Um, and to see what we've also said on those topics in the past, um, I think, is going to be super valuable. Um, and then just really the final slide um, to end on um, is just, I guess, a few key takeaways based on our experience over the last kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, you know, I'm assuming that a lot of people in this call probably are already doing this, but we're certainly being encouraged just to, you know, give it a go. Um, we're definitely sensing from talking to other communicators, there's a little bit of reticence. People are a little bit scared. They're not quite sure where to start. Um, but I think what we would just encourage is just I think it's really by using these tools that you really learn what they're capable of. Um, to operate with some degree of urgency because things are moving quite rapidly. Um, and I think there's, you know, within the communications field, I think we're certainly feeling like a, an expectation that we should be using these tools just as, as much as other colleagues are. And so just really encouraging people to, to kind of get in there and get started. Um, but within all of that, never to lose sight of the value that you bring as a communicator. Um, but to just use these tools to actually help you. And so um, we mentioned, obviously, the data and measurement piece earlier. That's something we don't have a great deal of access to today. And so I'm super excited about that because that will just make my, um, you know, my, probably what I rely on today, which is a lot of kind of gut instinct and judgment based on 25 years of doing this work, um, to be able to be a lot more data driven, um, I think will just make what we do so much more credible. Um, and then the final thing that I would say is, you know, kind of the culture that you have within your team or organization. Um, and I think particularly the culture from the top, um, right from day one, our chief comms officer, a guy called Frank Shaw, has been very much advocating for us as a comms function to use these tools. He's been sharing how he's using them himself. Um, I think just creating that culture within an organization um, to really just say, you know, you've got permission to use these tools, please use these tools, sharing examples with one another. Um, that's certainly how we're learning within the comms function at Microsoft. Um, so with that, Kirsty, I think that's, that's me. So I'm just gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much. And Omay, you've been very patient in waiting. You have your question if you'd like to come off mute. Thank you so much. I love Copilot 365, don't get me wrong, but I actually do some demo. This is the fun part. When you bash last in just using Copilot PowerPoint, 365 PowerPoint, then you can say create a PowerPoint, bash slash uh, a PDF or a Word document. But I don't know why it seems I has a ghost live in my co-pilot. Every time when I practice for my presentation, it's there. But when I demo it, it disappears. Well, that sounds that's, really crazy. That's so my question you, is, yep, yep. what can I do if I encounter the bot like that? It doesn't make me look bad. I, I just say, I'm sorry, it was there, but. It was there. So that's number one is when you backslash and that couldn't find your document or that 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 option, that plum option just disappeared. So if you open your PowerPoint right now and you yes. open Copilot, then you know backslash the file. Yeah. What happened if that disappeared? So you've got a feedback button that you can actually do at the moment. I mean, you have to remember that Copilot is still in its baby, you know, steps infancy. It's only been out for a short period of time. And there's a lot of changes going on, especially in the PowerPoint side of things. At the moment, there's been some pretty big shifts. Um, I can certainly report that back into, you know, the PowerPoint team. If you can send, you know, screenshots or you can also put it into, you've got your feedback portal, portals or through the tech community where you can actually show a screenshot shot of what it's actually doing or you know small videos of what it's doing to capture so that it can be reported as a as a bug there might be something happening for you uh, I know that there's there's that you know there's uh, I mean I can't say that I've seen it happening in my environment I don't know if there's anyone else but uh, you know I haven't seen that happening yeah 
I, I have a recording. The session was recorded, so you will see me like pretty embarrassed at the moment, but I will send you the recording and I did yep. send a follow up recording for that group to say, hey, I don't know why after restart my computer, I have this. So I will I yep. will I will have a screenshot and send the script. Second yep. question is that. I know a follow follow feature has been talked about last year on yep. Microsoft Outlook. But when I practice and just play with it and when I follow a meeting, I thought automatically we should get a note if we are in the same organization. Is that true or not true? That's a follow feature. So if you have multiple meetings in Microsoft Outlook. One, in terms of um, some of the problem solvings or a few other things, what I can do is let's have a conversation. I'm more than happy to, you know, spend a bit of time, Wonderful. you know, with you outside of outside of the outside of the session um, and have a look and pass through some information to the teams for you. Thank you, Christy. Okay. I will find your link in and I'll ping you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Hey, any other questions for um, Elizabeth, Liz, and Lisa? If not, thank you so much to both of you for joining. Please feel free to, to you know, stay if you wish to and or I, I know that you've um, probably got lots that's actually going on <laughs> along the way. I have dropped into the presentation. So when you do go and have a look, the presentation link is now in there for you to be able to go back and, and have a little bit of a look at if you need it. So. Um, if there's no other questions, I haven't seen any questions specifically in chat for you. Thank you so much for giving us a bit of an idea of how you're using it in your demos, Lisa, and you know how the how the business is tracking and what you're looking at trying to do to even build for yourselves inside Microsoft to make you know life a little easier around around AI. So thank you so much. Okay, let's get stuck Thanks, in now. We'll come back around. And turn the spotlight back over to get in and get started. Okay, ton of stuff across adoption. Um, some really fabulous content that's actually being created and put out there by the both the adoption team, um, the research analysis, you know, along work lab and some um, some great stuff that's flowing through for us as in this change space, even across the comm space for those that are communicators in. So let me walk through a couple of the things that we're really seeing come up to be able to help and support us. And then I'll start on the what's new in terms of some of the features there. Um, if you're wanting to have a look, or if you don't actually join the champions calls I would highly recommend joining some of the champs calls they do run during the um, um, during the daytime at 10 o'clock in Australian time unlike just a lot of them run through the middle of the night so you can do one or the other by the way the next one coming up is not until the September 24th they're actually having a break in August Okay, but fine, that's okay. So they had to have a bit of a break and we'll see them back again in September. So we won't have one for next month's presentation, but there's some great information in there, the best um, practice. There's a couple of things that have come through around SharePoint as a web UI toolkit that might be of interest. So those champs calls, it's just talking about their break. Um, don't forget you can go in now. There's the new community news desk. So one to go and have a bit of a bookmark and keep an eye out on in terms of the community news desk. Don't forget they've also put out there now the new Microsoft Community Learning Channel. So a lot of the videos that you're actually seeing and here we're seeing flowing through into some of their blogs as well to help support the what is it type message. So there's some good content in there. Caruana recently did a talk for MIT around humans in the era of AI. It only goes for a little over seven minutes. One I just recommend having a little bit of a listen to, doesn't go for particularly long and is of value. There is a white paper, some more information. I've got a ton of different white papers and links to some of the some of the um, podcasts that have come out at the moment. One of them was this, uh, you know, AI data drop and the jobs that they're seeing that AI has a bit of an advantage. So if you're inside a business and you kind of go, well, what does it look like? Maybe you're skewed very heavily to a particular type of role. You can start to use some of these statistics um, that are perceived time savings that's in there. A lot of this comes from the Work Trend Index 
aspects and it's some of the back end being adjusted around and shown in different ways, by the way. Okay. The work lab podcasts that are actually out there, and I know occasionally I've put some of them up. I want you to have a look at, and you can subscribe to the podcast on either Spotify and or Apple, depending on where it is you want to go. Some really good content in there around the AI side of things. And if you're not on the road to AI from a business perspective, then I would highly recommend that even from a personal perspective, you get your head around it because it is moving and marching forward fast and hard. And I would hate to see ourselves as, as you know, change leaders in this business, not understanding what's going on or the impact when whether it's in the current organization or you move to another organization that you're prepared and ready. Some of the podcasts that are out there as well, there's some really good, um, uh, not just the podcast that you can listen to, but the transcripts, because I know some of us don't deal as well with the with the um, audio. We prefer to actually read. So if you're more a visual learner, they do have it all there in transcripts as well. And one of the long, one of the ones that I do like is this How to Build New Habits of the AI Era. Another one is Enlisting AI in Your Fight Against Email Overload. So it's a good one, and it also comes off the back of the work trend index for you. So one to have a bit of a read of and then measuring the value of AI at work. Now, I believe I may have bought this one up previously. I did go for a bit of a hunt to double check, but I couldn't find it. So I've put it back in for you. Okay. Now, in terms of the release notes and what's actually gone up on the adoption site to support us, some great content um, of which some of those podcasts and information is in here, but there's some PDFs and some PowerPoints of value. In the Viva Adoption Resources, so on one of the blogs, dropped in a whole list of Viva Adoption Resources, and I'm going to walk through some of these that have come out that are of real value for us. There is the Viva Connections as an overview PowerPoint. So if you're going down this road or you're trying to explain it or you're dealing with senior leadership, what I'm loving is that Microsoft are using a lot of that internal content or content that they're using for um, conferences and things like that. And they're now making it uh, readily available for the rest of us in the community to be able to draw from. So I'm particularly liking this. So in there, it's actually got an experience walkthroughs set up and configuration for connections because a lot of times the people that are building things like Viva Connections are our knowledge managers and now you know change managers are going in and building these sorts of things or you're in HR and you're setting it up it's not necessarily the IT department that's actually doing these sorts of things from a user experience because it sits under the employee experience banner okay so often these are skills that we may need to know then there's how to build Viva Connection cards. So this is going into a little bit more depth, a little bit more technical as well, but it's in there to be able to help and support you. What is the extensibility that you can put on top of your Viva Connections to connect in? Lots of other apps, even those line of business apps to be able to bring them over into your Viva Connections. There is um, a great presentation in um, Viva, the Viva Engage in terms of building communities and understanding the why, the how, the wherefore. Um, I would recommend going and having a look through this presentation, just one of the many pages in there for you to have a little bit of a trawl through. You might find that there's content that you could be putting into your own programs as part of introductions or training, for example. There's the Transforming Communications with Viva Engage, and it's got a couple of step-by-steps and demos and and how to and why you would be doing it in terms of um, adjusting your communications around within the business to be able to use the likes of Viva Engage and AI as part of it and how you can use Copilot in Viva Engage to start doing some shifts. So I would recommend it. Another one is the Employee Survey Campaign Playbook. What can you use across that employee experience platform to be able to do survey campaigns? Which technology? How would you do it? Why would you do it? With examples, uh, it's a particularly good playbook that I um, that I like. So if you do have your Viva license experience up and running there, go and have a look at it because it will actually help and support you knowing the ways that you can kind of bring it all together. Because often the challenge is we see these things as a little bit um, separate and you're doing it in one thing, but you're not doing it over necessarily another or understanding the connections between them. So some good leadership there on that. 
how you can do news and announcements with Viva Amplify. So what does that actually look like? What are the campaigns that you can build? Um, I've talked about some of the campaigns and the templates in the past that are available around Viva Amplify. If you don't have it, I would, it's one of those ones I would highly recommend instead of doing a post on SharePoint and an email that goes out and a, and something that goes into Teams and something that goes into, instead of doing all those things individually, you can just build a campaign and Amplify and it just pushes out right across and you can build the campaigns. What I found particularly industry in, interesting and it came up just recently is that, um, you know, Laurie and Strand was having a chat and said, did you realise that when you build the campaign, the campaign itself sits in your OneDrive? But it creates a SharePoint and a group where you're loading all of your content in for it to use. But the campaign's in personal, people's personal OneDrive. And you kind of go, well, then what happens when someone leaves and that campaign that actually goes with their OneDrive? I'm not quite sure why it's sitting in the OneDrive. There's a bit of a challenge there. Something to um, take note of and, you know, we're, we're putting that through to the team is a bit of a why. Um, so you might want to have some of those campaigns potentially moved out if you do do them personally and save them or back them up into your SharePoint. There's the new corporate communication strategy playbook that's actually come out. Um, what you can actually do, the some of the challenges that are there. I particularly like some of the challenges that are in there around corporate communication. So it's got some advice and some scenarios around you how you can actually do, um, you know, different ways to be able to do your communications to make sure that you get the audience participation that you might need. Um, and if you haven't seen it, the we had the previous sessions with swoop around communications on the likes of SharePoint and how long are they spending and are they watching it and are they reading it and off the back of this that might actually help you too if you want to go back and watch that. Yep. Um, how to enable advanced uh, collaboration analytics. There is a whole video series that's actually out there and what's come in and I have talked a little bit about this one particular um, before but that was sort of right back at the beginning when we only had, I suppose, a couple of videos. There is a few more there, but now you can even download them if you want to. So understanding some of those um, analytics are important for us in our roles as well, because it's not just about rolling out a campaign. It's actually about what comes, you know, before in terms of measuring and what comes afterwards is to have something to to show how we've moved from moved the organization from one point to another. So one to recommend. Okay. There is the Intelligent Meeting recap videos that are out there around Microsoft Teams Premium. So a whole how-to video series for you. There's been some more videos that have actually gone up when I first brought this in. There, I think it was only about four or five when I first talked about it. So there's a few more there now. If you're considering Teams Premium or you do have it, there are some ones that there you might have links in your own, you know, SharePoint, maybe you've got a SharePoint learning site or you're using the um, Microsoft, you know, learning platform, maybe you've got pathways, for example, you might be able to plug some of these in. And or maybe you've got the champions platform and you want to start putting it into your champions platform as links to kind of go, champs, we want you to go start watching this because we're rolling out Teams Premium as an example. Okay. Lots of ways that you could use a lot of this content, by the way. Um, the Microsoft Copilot dashboard, when it comes to metric interpretation, this is a bit of a white paper around some of the things that you actually um, can do with the metrics, what it's doing and why you might kind of plug it in. So I put the table in here for you. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a particularly long white paper in terms of the metric interpretation, but I think this was the core thing that would actually really help you around, you know, what research is going in there, why it might have increased or decreased as a metric to give you some context. There's also in here um, this Accelerate Copilot enablement with Microsoft Viva. Now, I've talked about the, the, the new Viva um, package that you can actually roll out around Copilot. It just enables and pushes it out for you to be able to support you. But I in, in here, and it does talk about that, it's got there the steps that you can actually go through um, as well as, you know, what features and functionality is going to be available 
for your campaigns across the different applications. So you'll see here over on the right as to what's going to be included if you don't or if you do have those Viva licenses. If you want to try and understand what you're going to get from a campaign kind of perspective, then this will help you. Especially if you're trying to do a, um, you know, you know, why should we have it? Uh, or maybe, you know, the IT team is trying to battle to, to get it. So there's some good content out there to support you when it comes to that ROI. Um, Viva Amplify have got the, there's a rollout enablement. So if you're looking at rolling out Viva Amplify, it's actually got, you know, what can you do, the T minus timings and, uh, and some other, you know, bit of demo demo info in there and screenshots and a couple of things to be able to help and support you on your um, process to learning or talking about it with senior leadership. There's been updates to the training content map. Now, sometimes we see this particular page hasn't necessarily been updated in some of the things like the success kit, or if you're a partner on the call and you're over in the SMB side, then it hasn't actually been updated. But if you go to the adoption site or you click on this link, the standalone underneath the user enablement, the training content map, it has got the latest. The main changes are very much in here. We've now got got the full full kit has kind of flowing through so that's where there's been a bit of a shift in the scenarios library there's some new information that's come in especially under a new that new sort of some of those categories marketing and sales are the big two new categories we've seen them building when we first started there was really only kind of legal and finance if i remember a what little while ago it wasn't that long ago really um we're seeing a lot more scenarios in these functional scenario kits that you can go and download so this one here was the marketing one so downloading all the presentations in marketing and under there. So for example, if you open up the product launch, it'll have that scenario. It's a little bit of a day in the life of slash scenario of what you might do and how you might do it when it comes to Copilot, if you're trying to push it out. Now, underneath operations, so if you're looking in the operations kit, for example, there is a um, presentation in there around the change management side of things. It is not working. Um, I went to go pull it down and I've reported it as coming up with not available to the team. So cross fingers, I'll be able to show you that um, next month. Or I'll keep an eye out and, and I might even try, try and put something in chat if I remember. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll talk about it next month. Hopefully, it's it's up and running so that we can physically see that presentation. There is um, in the adoption site a new component that's dropped in. When you have a look at products, some things will come and go and say it's new or they hang around for a really long time. The AI Learning Hub is now being plugged in underneath training to be able to help and support us in terms of getting skilled up and ready. If you haven't had a look at the AI Learning Hub, if you're looking at the co-pilot side of things, it's all now coming together in one place. A lot of these sites are also getting a bit of a revamp to be able to help us and support us by these um, uh, new uh, kind of filtering components running across the top here to be able to support us depending on what it is that you're um, looking at. So if you're wanting to see things like what are the training events that I could actually join, you can just click on the button. Um, another one is this a video that's actually come out, the um, Ready, Set, AI. So this is some of the science research that's telling us about AI readiness that we can see around the people from the people science team. So I've put a few links in here to be able to help and support some really interesting information. It does go for about an hour. So some of this stuff, you need to kind of set yourself a little bit of time. But if it's something that interests you, it's one I would recommend. So there's Ready, Set, AI, which is the link up the top. And then there are three extra links there for you for other content if you want to go and have a look. Um, a, a blog post that's actually gone out in tech community is Prompt Like a Pro. It's actually got eight tips there to be able to help and support you. Now, we've often talked about the different ways to be able to do prompting. It does have there a sample prompt. These are things we've kind of talked about a little bit more before, but I do particularly like this insightful and relevant questions for an executive meeting where it lists out a little bit more, a much bigger prompt. 
Now, I see a lot of these very small kind of prompts, but often we're not going far enough in our prompt. If we're trying to do something that's a little bigger and a little bit more complex, we need to make sure that we're speaking to it or talking like we would to an assistant that we want to get them to do, you know, um, you know, a 15 page white paper. We're going to need to give them a whole heap more, you know, guidance, for example. And of course, we've got Rishi on the call. So Rishi's enabling modern, uh, his mocha. So that modern collaboration, the updates to his documentation. We've got version 3.1 is now out there recommending you go and download. So that's come through this month. Thank you very much, Rishi, for you and your team and all the hard work you do across this space. Microsoft Fever Insights, there is a PDF, a little bit of a white paper with some of the key takeaways around organizational network analysis. Now, there's a couple of things around analysis. This has actually taken some of the Viva analysis pieces here. Um, and there's more that comes as part of some of the white paper with some links uh, in here and some of the other core components I'm going to be bringing up soon. But there is, you know, how can you actually go in and measure some of that change? change and what does it actually look like to be able to do some of that network analysis along the way. Okay. Uh, whether you're an analyst yourself, maybe you're a, whether you're a behavioral analyst, whether you're a business analyst, whether you're a change analyst, uh, you know, they're all very core components. And often as change managers, we're a bit of both. We're a bit of all of it sometimes. So we're two or three roles. So we often need to know these things. There is a really good on-demand video that you can actually go, it's a, it's a blog post that's come out. And as part of that blog post, it's got 10 in-depth videos around Microsoft Viva. This comes from that community um um, YouTube channel that I was talking about right back towards the very beginning. So it's now pulled together for you. What are the core videos that will actually help you that you could go and over time do a bit of learning? You know, try and make sure you're setting yourself aside a couple of hours each week to do some learning each month because this technology is just absolutely barring along. Unless you start blocking it out in your diary, guys, we're going to get left behind. Moving too fast moving too fast. <laughs> um, we need to have time for learning. And, you know, Microsoft have now, if you were at the conference, you know, we were told that they're now setting aside one day a week to dedicate to learning so that they can stay ahead of the, uh, ahead of the wheel and a bit of our rat race. There is in the project management side in Microsoft Planner, a new day in the life of guide for uh, Microsoft Planner and one that I'd recommend going and having a look. There's lots of great day in the life of. So this one is the CDR program manager, a new one that's been put out there. There's an infographic that's been put out as well in terms of what's actually going on with Planner, why would you use it? And um, what I particularly like about these sorts of things is it helps us to write, say you wanting to roll out or do an education piece, maybe you're doing some comms emails, for example. These kind of infographic pages gives us some perfect wording to be able to plug in around the benefits of. You know, often we see, oh, it's very marketing. It's like, well, you know, what are we doing when we're trying to convince them the benefits of <laughs> the new planner and we're going to upgrade to, for example, yeah? Don't forget you've got your community day calls that are actually out there for you to be able to join. So anyone can go and join these more often than not. For us, though, they're the middle of the night. So if you are a bit of a night owl and you are up at midnight or at 1 a.m., maybe you want to join in. Any questions on any of the adoption stuff that I've seen or trawled through before we start on what's new to M365? Seeing any hands going in the air yet? Nothing gone into chat that I can see. Lots happening in the adoption space now, guys. We're not getting kind of left behind anymore. It's really moving forward and uh, it's great to see. And I'm sure that... Um, there's uh, plenty there that I would say that, you know, Rishi would recommend that you also do as well. <laughs> Mind you, he may not be on the call anymore, potentially. So, okay. Let's have a look at what's new. So this came from the community presentations that go out there for the champs calls, those community champs calls. It is the Microsoft designer and co-pilot. Designer is now out there in general. So it's general availability. It's no longer as part of 
you know, beta or private preview. It's you do need at this point, you know, um, things like a, a bit of a personal prescription subscription to be going in and using a lot of it. However, it is embedding into starting now so it should already be embedded in there's the whole ai generated going into now powerpoint and word to be able to build with designer plugged into it and even more so around cap copilot capabilities to be able to start creating and generating and it uses dali for that um, generation in the in the back end okay so designer so you'll see here available personal account my pet didn't want to work. So in that personal account, okay? So if you're trying to log in with your corporate email address, it's not going to work for you. Um, Copilot coming in to assist you with your loop page creation. So it's got these, you know, sharing those work plans, getting it in there, using loop to be able to design and build and draft things with Copilot. And um, we have talked about this previously in the past. What I particularly liked was the little video that went in. I liked the little demo video. So it's in the presentation for you. Now, the what's new to Copilot, I know it seems like there's a lot of kind of AI stuff going on. There is, but I will be talking about all the others and teams and, and all the other functionality too. Okay? So from a Copilot standpoint, some of this I have touched on um, previously, things like, um, you know, enabling your community and uh, I've you know, talked about some of these these through the adoption components, but let's have a look at what we've got there. There is the extended availability now of the Copilot dashboard. So in the past, you had to have the premium license if you wanted to see some of those you know, Copilot um, more advanced insights. That is not the case anymore. If you have over 100 licenses purchased, or you have 10 premium licenses for Viva, you are going to now be able to see that full Microsoft Copilot dashboard to be able to give you those greater visibility. So it's no longer just part of the premium. It's if you have over 100 licenses to Copilot or over 10 Viva premium licenses, it is now going to be included for you. So is that clear? Is anyone not clear as to, you know? Okay. In the um, some of the user capabilities, you can actually now turn those prompts into inspirational action. So what's going on is when you go into the prompts, it now has a try it in Microsoft 365 or try it in Word. or So it's all grounded in the actual um, prompt now so that you can then run that prompt and what does it actually look like. So I'm liking the fact that it will you know, take that prompt from the Copilot you know, lab itself and take you over to be able to try. Another one is in OneNote supporting inked notes. I've got here a couple of scenarios that you might want to try where you've got handwritten notes. Maybe you want to summarize your inked notes. Um, and like all things, when it comes to inked notes, it is a learning capability. So over time, it will understand your writing a little better with Windows. We used to have a lot of, um, we could train it in Windows, but now it's sort of built more into it to do sort of automatic learning based on um, graph and how you fix things up when you're when you're handwriting. Maybe you're converting it over to text, for example. Okay. We can, and this came through, you know, a little bit ago, the uh, ability to be able to, with Word, on a selection of things like texts or lists or tables, make changes, auto rewrite, or maybe you want to visualize as a table, or maybe it's in a table and you want to convert it over to a paragraph with bullet notes, or, um, you know, translate into other languages, for example. Don't do what I did where I transferred it to a native language and then when I went to go type in the prompt, it did it in that language. <laughs> so you kind of have to go, you know, go back and convert it back over, you know, or make sure it then is in English because it continued on in another language. So it was an interesting exercise to go through. Um, some other new capabilities, there is the enhanced data understanding. So Copilot in Excel is moving forward quite quickly. When it's um, going in and you're doing the prompting, we've now got some of the, you know, what's going on in the changes. It's supporting quite complex uh, 
uh, data as well as complex things like conditional formatting and do you actually want to apply it? So instead of it just doing things automatically or saying we can't do that, this is where you're going to find conditional formatting, for example, it is now embedded in and you can look at it first. So you're getting these previews. So I do like the previews. I've put in videos here for you, um, demoing some of those two capabilities. Another one is being able to draft an email using that right-handed side chat, actually having it I mean, running down the right like we do in the likes of Word or PowerPoint or Excel. It wasn't there in Copilot. That is now coming into play and coming soon. It's sort of rolling out now-ish. It's not actually hit my tenant yet, but you'll be able to do things like, you know, move all email from a particular email address into somewhere. Okay, so it has actually rolled out. I do like that, you know, a quick prompt instead of trying to filter or search and then, you know, doing your drag and drop, you can just now ask it. So a great time saver. I think I do this sort of stuff all the time. Generally, I just move everything into an archive inbox. I don't put things into folders. Mm. Waste too much time. Uh, it's much easier search and the things that you can find now with Copilot. You don't need to. So improved document documentation summarization. I thought that was a raffle. It will now contain up to 80,000 words, depending on the language. This is four times more than it previously did in the past. So it was showing a demo of a 66-page Word document that it can now summarize. Because in the past, it was like about, you know, at one point it was like 10 pages. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, that's not great when you've got a big document that you want to have summarized. So this is this is rolling out. I do like those bigger summarizations. Another one is creating quizzes in Copilot. You can actually ask it to give you some quizzes with correct answers in it. So I did one. I had a little bit of a fun with this one. I did create me a quiz on Copilot in Word. And let's just see, you know, who knows what. I wanted to have a bit of a play around and see what it actually did. Um, and it had a ton of questions that I really liked. So from a, what I particularly liked for this was as a trainer, sometimes we want to get to know and we want to do a, um, a learning analysis within our business of to know where is the skill sets at in the business. So we want to, you know, have a look a little at this. So if you want to do like a training needs analysis, a great way to be able to do a bit of a quiz for your business, just use Copilot to ask it. Bonus. Okay. Now, coming soon, there is the new productivity tips around growing your business. This is from the SMB team or SMC team at Microsoft. So they have their blog that's actually gone out there. I'm really looking forward to the tip series because it's often grounded in some really good uh business use cases that are every day. When we look at small businesses and the way that they would actually use it, uh, I, I like that sometimes more than some of the things we might be doing in an enterprise because it can be um, a little bit user, a little bit more user friendly because the average small business owner might be, you know, an organization from one to, you know, 50 people. And the things that we might do, we, we often may not want to go huge or big, but what are the core things that we could work with? So I, I'm really looking forward to that one. There is some updates in terms of the Viva Amplify for the user capabilities to be able to now do you know, editing. And what it's doing is we can come in, we can have a bit of a play. Copilot is now embedded into Viva Amplifier. Okay, so it's got a whole editor using Copilot now. So we're seeing it driving into more and more products. So this is the new one. What's new to Teams? Let's move on. So there is now Teams cross-cloud guest access for the web. So this is the web side now. This means that external parties can participate more in that collaboration experience when it comes to chat, meetings, channels, Teams, things like, you know, video screen sharing um, for one-on-ones and chats and all those sorts of things that are actually coming into play. But, you know, and, and then admins can, you know, set up that trust between the different tenants to be able to support that cross-tenant access as well, by the way, to be able to support you. Um, another one is the search results are going to throw up now things from chat as well. So it's going to have these suggestions pop up. It will include things like the, the sender name and pictures and the context, the date and, you know, presence and links and file attachments. So I'm liking all of that coming up as part of those search results. Fabulous.
Haven't got a screenshot of it yet for you, but you know, maybe I'll have one again soon. Okay. Um, the new meeting gallery coming into play. We know that when it comes to the gallery, we can see up to 49, but now we can pick and choose from the 16 on. So once you get to 16, you can actually go into the larger gallery. But now you can say how many you actually want to see on the screen. So it's 4, 9, 16 or 49 as part of that large gallery. So even though it starts at 16, you could then just limit it down to 4. In terms of Teams events, there is now the ability to put your presenter into a particular order for your webinar so that you can physically have them going in an order and adjusting them as part of that. And um, it can be found under the presenter bio section, by the way, if you're looking for it. Another one is managing what those attendees see in terms of updates for a town hall and webinar. So you can make some changes there. So there's a bit of a link there on how to. There is also now, and this is one, there's a lot there around, uh, there's a lot in there around Teams calling and Teams phone functionality and uh, in meetings. I've only pulled out one or two for us because there is a, there was a few there. But the one I particularly love is that Copilot now will bring in better speaker recognition and IT can activate things like voice profiles. So you can actually create your voice profile so that Copilot can actually recognize in meetings using Teams rooms, those voice profiles to be able to build out using Copilot. So this one is one that I get asked on all the time. We're in a meeting room and there's 10 of us and we're using one Teams meeting and will Copilot recognize my voice over my manager's voice over? Okay. This is all being built in. And I always say it depends on your device and depends on what you've set up. This is that final piece in the cog. We now can do custom emojis and reactions in Microsoft Teams. However, one of those things to note is admin, yes, you can turn it on and off and you, or you can go turn off but select just users that can create and delete them because ultimately you do have a maximum of 5,000. So if you've got a large business, maybe you've got a, you know, 115,000 business and you've got lots of people creating their own little custom emojis, things could go pear-shaped pretty quickly. So you might want to lock down who can and can't create them for the business. Okay. Now, Another one. Now we had this in Teams Classic. So we're now in Teams New. It's just Teams now because it's no longer the classic. But in the past, in a post, we were able to turn off the notifications on a particular post. Maybe you started it, but you're not managing it or you're going away and you want to turn off those notifications. It is now in there and available. Yay. It's one I've been missing for quite a while. So I'm very pleased to see that's come back again. Another one is assigning different sounds to different notifications. So you can do things, you know, you know, making things a little bit more urgent if you need to, and you can mute them if you wish to as well. So some more features and functionality. Another one is that Discover feed. Uh, Microsoft have been asked to have the ability to be able to turn off the Discover feed in your channel list for those that do or don't want it. This can be done. It is underneath your general settings to do it. Now on the SharePoint roadmap, let's go have a look at some of these features and functionalities. Some I'm talking about now, some I'm talking about a little later in the presentation because SharePoint does can kind of bring in stuff from Teams and OneDrive and, you know, all, all over the place. So I'll talk about some, some you might want to read or I've talked about in the past. So I'll only touch on the relevant ones for now. One of them is the enhancements to text web parts. I'm, I'm particularly liking this. There's a lot more bullet style lists, you know, in the, it, yay. <laughs> I'm liking the fact that we've got some different ones there in terms of the list levels. Uh, so there's some of the ones, then you've got things like your yeah, alphabets, numbers, uh, Roman numerals, and the way we can start and starting the list. Maybe you've got a heading and you want to, but you want to continue on a list at a different number and have it moving on at number 22 off a, of, yeah, yay, instead of starting all over one like it another one is applying shapes to images nice you know often we don't always want a square picture now we can put little circles and add captions so this one I like because often I do things like if I'm doing um, maybe on my on my page on the left hand side I want to do that kind of a picture icon that represents 
for example, what's in the paragraph, you know, and I want a little nice circle like I might have in my email. A designer icon got a refresh. So that's the new designer icon. If you haven't seen it before or you might not have noticed it, it did get a refresh. Uh, there is also some different aspect ratios. Uh, I have been using this in terms of making sure that I can put something into both landscape and portrait along with the square. So it was doing square and landscape, but it wasn't necessarily always doing, you know, you know, portrait. So these have come into play. Plus, there's also some new designer tools around greeting cards, and you can do restyle of your images into things like pop art and doodle and cubism. And uh, there is a video I've dropped in the link to the video on how you can actually do that if you want to watch. So I found that one in my trawling around for you. Uh, so now the June one, so the June here, by the way, I wasn't able to present it back in June because it didn't come out to the 8th of July. So we had our user group on the second. Um, so now this is the July, the July, not the June, I'm doing the two. This is the July SharePoint um, roadmap as to what's going on and what I liked. There is new content panes for your pages and news that have come into play. So you might see that actually flowing through. So this is kind of that main toolbox here. And then it goes into, you know, it's various components and web parts, media, templates to be able to help and support you when you look at the more. So these are the different look and feels. Now, this is also flowing through into other functionality like um, Amplify. If you're looking at Amplify and it's looking at the SharePoint pages, so some of this is flowing, you'll see it flowing through into other spaces. I've put in the YouTube video, which was from the community um, um, YouTube to be able to help and support you. So that's, that's in here from that community hub and the... Um, blog. So there's a couple of different components there. The next one is, and we have been waiting for a long time for this to finally come out and be available. I was uh, looking at this on the roadmap two years ago. All right. So, and it's been asked for some time. It is finally here to be able to co-author and collaborate on SharePoint pages and news pages. Hallelujah. It will show you who is in, who's in what particular um, uh, web part, for example, to support you. I've dropped in a video as well as some of the how to in the blog to support you. Next one is there are additional file types for filtering. We often have fairly standard filtering, but with the new um, extensions that have come into play that's now dropping into your OneDrive, we can now filter on all these extra components, not just Word, Excel, PowerPoint and PDFs and things like that, for example. We can do loop. You know, a lot of people were going, what is the, you know, dot .ll, dot .l -o -o -p file and not understanding kind of what these things are. This will actually help them. So show them how they can filter based on file types. The next one, uh, now this one is one that we'll need to do a little bit of education around. When they are opening up that shared folder experience, the the view is going to change just a little in terms of that, you know, what does it do when it takes it to that user folder in, it is jumping over to the people view in their OneDrive. OK, so it's going to the people view when it comes to files that are actually shared. There's a whole heap in the SharePoint Premium. I particularly like the autofill that's actually going on in there and how SharePoint Premium can help you around autofilling. Hmm? One to have a look at. There's a whole heap in there. Some of it goes into graph API and gets quite technical, but that one core one is the one that I want to call out for now. There in um, uh, the, the OneDrive current information that's actually gone out, there is a blog around some on-demand training where it's got four in-depth episodes. It's got the recent podcast episodes from OneDrive and that sync up that I often will pull information from and the internet zone. Um, also, it's got then all the recordings that are on demand across the community conference. So I, um, if you want to kind of get your head around what's going on in OneDrive, what's happening at the moment, then this is 
is the way, this is the place to go to be able to get yourself up to speed. In planner, now I already showed you some of those day in the life of in planner. There is some extra features and functionality down the bottom of this planner preview because I've talked about planner and I've given you links to the planner and the preview and the content that's actually out there and I've bought it in plenty of times. On this particular blog, the reason that I've bought it in, it's a new blog. It is a new blog that's gone out there with lots of steps of things of how to, but down the bottom for us, I particularly liked the resources that were being brought together on that particular blog to be able to help and support us. Okay, thanks. So. Next one in terms of new to planner is the ability to create your own custom fields. I love it because, you know, one of those things with planner, if you're doing, and don't forget this is that premium functionality. So it's the, you, you'll you have the um, the pro version or you might say you've got um, your busy your project for the web. If you've got project for the web, so that's actually a subscription to project the web, it gives you the premium version, which allows you to then be able to do things like um, custom fields if you're wanting to do. And if you haven't known it before, you can actually do your Windows plus semicolon, and that allows you to bring up your emojis, or you can do it with your full, full stop as well. Um, the other ones are you can do colors, so you can do a bit of sort of that conditional formatting and and use the um, paint bucket. There's a little paint bucket icon here. So creating your own. I like it. I know, Shari, isn't it fantastic? I know, we're back in 2019. was forever ago they talked about it. So it's nice to see it's flowing through. No. Uh, next one is the um, new planner in Teams, or are we talking about the last one in terms of features? Uh, there's other features. There's probably lots of stuff in the <laughs> – they've talked about it, talked about it, but it's here. Um, the other one is now there's some new features around copying the link to the plan, be able to do persistent filters and sorting, and then the assigning task cards in Viva Connections. Now, this opening the plan, the video I've got here is the opening the plan from the task. So it's not just having the task in there now. So if you're in the planner, or it used to be called, you know, um, task for planner and to do, you know, it was running here. So planner is on the left rail. You can plug it in as its app in the left rail. Now in there, if it is an action, it will come up to the top and it will allow you to be able to launch from here and physically see the plan from each card. Nice. Another one is in Viva Connections, you can actually have assigned tasks in there. So it will go, you've got an urgent assigned task. Do you want to add it onto your um, to-do slash planner? Okay. So we've got adding a task and it can be dropped in in your Viva Connections. Viva Connections will be both customised by the business but can also be customised uh, for you as well in terms of cards. Another one that's actually come into Planner, and this, of course, is part of that you know premium version as well, is Sprints. So if you've got the premium plan for Planner, you can then use Sprints to be able to do things like, um, you know, grouping particular information. If you had um, Jira, so a lot of people were very used to having Jira, of which you had Sprints in Jira, this is going to be very similar to those Sprints and having those Sprints ret retrospective. But it is going to be um, based on, of course, whether you've got this as a subscription. Okay, so I do like the fact that you can view it, whether it be in a grid or a timeline or different charts. Where? We're nearly done, everyone. Um, in forms, another functionality is that sharing your form to be able to collaborate. You can work together on it. You can add and remove questions. You can work with styles. Others can send out the invocations. They can view the results. And not only can they view the results, but they can actually check individual result and responses as well. So it's not just the overarching. Another piece that's come that's new to forms, it's got this new functionality where you can actually validate open text responses. So this has now come into play where it goes, the restrictions is its text and it contains and what does it actually then have to contain? 
Okay, so I liking some of this functionality. Uh, another one is the lengths and max count. So there's all these open text validations going on as well. Um, restrictions, so it has to have an email address, which means that it's not just typing anything in. It's got to have literally the at functionality dot you know com dot whatever the case may be okay so you can put restrictions in um and you know some of that other functionality so i'm liking some of this um validation that we can do in forms coming into play so thank you forms another one is the copilot suggestions that you can use when it comes to Microsoft Forms, it will look at the theme, it will look at responses, it will look at settings, it will look at, you know, um, um, suggestions throughout it, the distribution and how you're distributing and whether it might need to be, you know, reminders sent out, for example. Um, so it's got lots of really great improvements with Copilot in Microsoft Forms for you now. There is, in terms of Microsoft Loop, some of the new functionality that's coming into play, but this one is instead a five-part learning series, which will actually be recorded, so you will be able to go back and see them, or you can go and register and watch them live. I'm really looking forward to this five-part learning series because, you know, when we look at this, they're all videos and things that we can actually plug into our own learning platforms for our business. Sometimes these can be fairly long, so it's up to you or maybe you use it to create some of your own training content. But don't forget this moves so fast that it um, can be hard to have content that we've built in a business. Another one is the guest sharing. I have talked about guest sharing in the past, but we didn't actually have screenshots or information as to what that looked like. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat in here. If you do invite in guests to a workspace or maybe you've invited them into a page, you'll need to wait just a moment before you go in and invite them into a workspace. So it says wait for about one to two hours before you go invite into a workspace. If you want to know how to, so if you're seeing here, this is a page so you can access, you've got the share, the link to this particular page or a particular component, for example, or when it's a workspace, you've actually then got, you know, the workspace component in terms of sharing. So it'll look a little different depending on what you're trying to share. Inside Loop, there are some new scenarios to be able to try where it's got in-app notifications. So notify inside Loop for a particular app. So there are lots of apps that you can actually plug in, things like even Trello. You know, you've got all these in apps, so you can then set up different notification and rules. So you set up rules around it when something is complete, for example. I'm liking some of these rules that are going on, so in apps. There is, from the Viva Engage team, some tailored support if you need to get off Workplace by Meta. So that's that Facebook, you know, Facebook for Work became Workplace by Meta. Uh, of course, it is going. So over time, you will need to transition yourself. It's going to be, I mean, it's going to be around for a little while, but nothing's going to be done. I think it's from, um, they want you off kind of December, but by July, it's, you know, kind of going, going. So if you want some support in that transition, Microsoft are offering uh, some pricing to be able to help and support you as part of that fast track surface, um, uh, fast track surface <laughs> offering um, and or partners that can actually help and support you to do that rollout. They've got information around what training and resources and experts to be able to support you. Okay. Another one is in, in Viva Engage, you can actually choose different layouts. You can say where the picture is going to be sitting. It's above um, or is the text above, for example, there is a massive view. You can have it instead of being square, it can then be landscape and it's it's got a little bit more around it. Okay. Another one is the recording will be available. Yes, it will be there afterwards for anyone that's had to fly. Um, in terms of Viva Engage, another one is that Copilot community to be able to remove the setup. It's all there to be able to flow. I've talked about it this before. Um, I've provided the kit before. It's a um, good blog to be able to help and support you around what that looks like to be able to edit and customize it as needed.
Viva Engage have actually got a digital safety and a moderation webinar coming up by the team. Um, go and register. It's at the end of the month. We have an Australian time zone. It's lucky that we've got, you know, Australians here and they're very um, supportive of us down under here and um, with having had, you know, previous product managers based in Australia it's good to see we still get those time zones here. One to go on and watch. The What's New to Beaver Insights, be able to send out poll surveys. Uh, there's some integration now around new hire and onboarding to be able to support you. Have a look at those new surveys. Um, in terms of Viva Insights, this is on their blog a ton of great information. There is some fabulous white paper and ebooks and information, including the scientific journal article that's actually sitting behind the workplace trend report. Now, what they've done is this particular white page white paper, when you go in and you have a look at it, there's some fabulous pages in there with some little tables and information really trying to help and support around what that looks like. Um, I've gone and had a bit of a trawl through. Inside this particular white paper leads you to the productivity report on top of that scientific journal. But this productivity report, I particularly liked because in there it actually goes into some of the consistency, how they've done it, why they've done it, what defined, for example, a power user, plus some of the variable importance predicting a power user. What was their most important thing that they looked at as a method and an outcome? outcome. Uh, from an analysis perspective, um, some uh, really rich information to be able to help us and support us, especially when we start to see some of those trends and all it's got is, you know, a stat. Uh, for us, if, you, if you're if you a little bit more in the um, analytic side of things, I used to be an analyst on the Telstra team. I was an analyst on the Telstra team. Um, for me, I find this quite fascinating and delving into it a little bit more. So if you like a little bit of analytics, go have a look. Um, Viva Amplify on their roadmap, you'll actually see that there's a lot of new content coming through. What I particularly liked on here, there is a whole heap of new metrics and capabilities to be able to support you when it comes to what happened when you pushed out that campaign. So if you are using Viva Amplify or you're thinking of it, what do you get with it? It is very rich in its power as to um, what's happening for you if you're here from the comms perspective because you've come in because we've had a comms topic today, then you know this is the type of stuff for you. And it's all in built in and allowing you to look at it inside the tenant and it's plugging all of your tenant components like SharePoint and email and other functionality all together into one. So you're not using external kind of um, a third party and having information outside your business. Another thing on the roadmap, there's a new experience to be able to customize your content for Outlook and Teams. So it is supporting some more familiar web parts. There's lots of improvements going on to be able to help you and choosing audiences, for example, and being able to edit. This is rolling out now and over the next month or two. Next one is, remember I said that that toolbox for SharePoint is flowing through and looking into Amplify. This is showing you what it actually looks like. So it's now a little bit more user-friendly in terms of being able to explore and insert content to be able to distribute out and giving you a bit of guidance on, on how to be able to do that as part of Amplify. Another one that I'm loving, this one here was like music to my ears, being able to reuse content. Hallelujah. Finally, look, I know Amplify is still a somewhat new product, but it was one that I get asked all the time. It's like, can I just copy like you would if it was a SharePoint page or something like that? And at the time it was, well, well no, but you can now reuse content to be able to support you across SharePoint, Outlook and Teams. Another one. Now, this is a simplified process when it comes to requiring approval. So it is literally a toggle on and then who is it going to, okay? So it's a very lightweight compliance, but it does allow you to be able to, I suppose, stop sensitive information going out there when it comes to doing campaigns, okay? 
There is, in terms of Viva Connections, some, you know, feed parts and video news. And the whole thing is retiring. There are some alternatives coming into play to be able to support you, but it is retiring if you are using those web parts, by the way. There is a whole heap going on in terms of Viva Pulse, lots of new templates, the um, reports around, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, cards, connections, stuff around larger audiences, as well as some of this audit support for e-discovery as part of Pulse. Now, the next one is... If you're wanting to look at this new modernized user experience, there is some user defined permissions being able to go on in terms of like restricting editors, for example, and other functionality. However, to have this, to be able to do those user defined permissions, you will need to have sensitivity labels available and activated your RMS to be able to see this more advanced functionality when it comes to permissions for specific people or groups. For Office, there are some file menu improvements going on in here. Um, you can click on the file name. This is the big one, the big change that's actually going on for the web. You're clicking on the name now, and the name will give you locations and things like that, but it's not actually giving you, you used to have your file version available in there. It is not there. It has actually been moved over to file, and you're going to see the version history. It was there previously. Um, it is still there but it's now pretty much there only now okay so some of this has changed you've also got that autosave icon now so you're not necessarily kicking clicking directly on you can that rename is not there anymore to go up to the top uh-huh you so you now go in here to do your rename so if you've got um, training or guides or anything out there in regards to the web or the app, even in Teams, you look at the app in Teams, a lot of these functionality will flow through. It is changing on how to do this. So you will need to update your content. Okay. Um, there's a blog update in regards to the new Outlook. Um, with getting my new device, one of the downsides of the new device when you download Office 365, it only comes with Outlook new and you have to go and physically get Outlook Classic and start downloading it if you're wanting to do Outlook Classic. I found it personally a little frustrating because there are still some features that are not available in Outlook New, like being able to download and open up an ICS calendar that's given to you, for example, or you've got shared mailboxes still isn't available. Um, so that's something to keep and be aware of. There is a two-part um, series around assistants and delegates of how you actually can do, because a lot of people think that you can't do a lot if you're a delegate okay, or you're an executive assistant in the new Outlook. That is not the case. So it's got two-part series of how you can actually do things, um, sharing calendars, mailbox, folders, um, dealing with categories and notifications and, you know, don't send on RSVB tracked or preserve decline meetings or even following decline. So this is a new feature that's actually come in that's like, yay, so you can still follow it even if you've declined it, okay? I know. Um, new to Excel, uh, the core functionality in here, I've already talked about some of the others, like the Copilot. I talked about that back in the Copilot section. Um, but this modernized Excel grid, I particularly like. I'll talk about that in a moment. I've put in the link to the insiders around translate and detect language functions. So you can say this is in Japanese and you can have it translate it for you inside Excel. Nice. But what I particularly liked is um, when it comes to Excel and the grids and functionality, when it's for the web, a whole heap new features of coming into play. That little plus button like we see in tables for Word, for example, is coming into play for the web. Easy drag and drop elements, being able to highlight cells for clarity. Um, there's lots of streamlining of features for unhide and hide. Uh, so a lot more functionality there in terms of new to Excel. Um, another one that's come into play is you can go in here. Um, there uh, is things like the zoom in the status bar. You've got easy renaming of your sheets, for example. But I one that we will need to know and understand, especially if you're doing the training, is underneath file, you can now go in and go open recent documents. 
nice. I like this. This is one that I was like, oh, I like that. <laughs> Directly from a document that you're in. We didn't have that in kind of the past. Okay. Not for the web. Um, another feature is in terms of the forms, we had it for a long time that when you opened up the results in forms, it would create a new Excel. They then went, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to have it where it's syncing automatically so that you don't have to. But the problem was when you're in Excel, if you wanted to see new data, you had to still get out and open it up again. That is not the case coming forward. We're going to have that kind of a sync um, button effectively coming on where you could be working in it and it'll give you the live updates with information coming through in real time. So that is now available in forms. In the Insider blog, ton of new content. Um, we're used to in OneNote, that single stroke, you know, do a arrow or a circle or a shape or a whatever and get it to hold. It's now coming through into Word. So we're seeing some of that flowing across, which is fabulous. Next one is Word for the Web, same as what we have with Excel, that ease of functionality of being able to move things around and adding in columns, that's all flowing now into those single-click easy access on the ribbon for Word on the web. Go have a look and see if there's anything in particular that might have been you might have been struggling with in any of the um, um, versions of, of Office, depending on the rollout. So it will give you what we've actually fixed if you're having some problems. So, you know, link pictures were not updating or those things in Excel. It always tells you what's happening. There is the events catalog of all the various calls and training. Go have a look at it because these are in Australian, um, some of the Australian time zones. For example, maybe you want to have a look at it. You're a marketing professional and using Copilot, for example. You want to have a look at it for executive or sales. Uh, there's some fabulous free training going on. There's lots of community days happening all over the world. If you happen to be traveling or you're, some of them are virtual, some of them aren't, but you might be able to watch some of those community events around the world or join. Some are free, some aren't as well. Uh, don't forget in the presentation is my latest wheel. I am working on another one. Uh, I know there'll be another one out there. My YouTube channel, which is where you're going to find the recording once I take it live. Um, cross fingers, I'll have that out soon, but I am away next week. I am going to a um, wedding next week where I get to do a three-tier wedding cake and create a Dragon Ball Z cake. So I effectively got four cakes to do next week. So I'll be up to my eyebrows in um, buttercream. So cross fingers, I'll see how soon I can get this up for you. Um, normally I start getting it uh, once I've downloaded I get it up and running kind of um, by Monday or Tuesday but I won't be able to next week um, Collab Talk, lots of videos on the Collab Talk of course you know I spoke not that long ago um, at the Copilot studio around uh, the mastermind with uh, Daniel and his user group so don't forget there's the Copilot user group there is lots there Plenty of resources and links. Where do I find my information? The user groups that are actually out there, plus the previous recordings are all linked in the presentation. We come back on um, September the 3rd will be our next date. Um, September and October will be still on the Tuesday. This today was a little bit of anomaly. Always, if I have to move it, I usually only ever try and move it to the Friday, which is uh, used to be their Melbourne day, if it was the first Melbourne day of the month. Um, but November, I warn you now, we won't be having a session in November. So I'll give you a bit of advance notice because I will be having some leave. I am off with Go See the Northern Lights in Norway on a three week, you know, cruise and travel. So I won't be around. So you'll hopefully you'll miss me in November. But thank you so much, everyone, for coming. If you have any questions or you want to raise your hand or you want the presentation, here is the QR code for you. Thank you so much for coming along. I always appreciate the fact that you're here and you're joining in. Elena, you have a question for me. You've raised your hand. Hello. Thank you. My head slightly hurts, but it's, it's <laughs> like we do lots every of, month. Lots so much content. Um, I've just got a quick question in relation yep. to governance. So yes. scenario is we've had someone leave the business who yep. owned um, over 160 pages in our intranet. So uh -huh. the problem I've been trying to solve for this week is how do we, um, is there an automatic or a way we can fast track those pages to be updated with a new content owner or do we just individually need to go through each page and do it manually? 
Uh, very good. Shari, you're on the call. Come off mute. If anyone's probably going to know. Oh, sorry. I may have missed the question. She's a little faint for me. What was the question? The question was SharePoint sites, lots and lots of pages owned by someone left the business. Any way to be able to fix some of this bulk? Effectively, is that right, Alina? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So basically, we just need to update those pages with new owners. Um, and at the moment, we've been sort of sifting through them manually, which is obviously taking a bit of time. So just wondering if there's a way to fast track that. There would be tools, but I'm not sure exactly which ones because I have heard of them. You know, yeah, Sharon? I think Share, I think ShareGate does that. Yeah. Uh, it forces the check, ba check back in. Um, yeah. The problem is the whatever changes they've made that you can't see, you will lose. But yeah, the, the yeah that's right. Is, right. You can't see them. You didn't know what it was anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. What was and the then, name of that? Sorry. That was ShareGate. ShareGate. Share yeah. yeah. You also, as an owner of the site, can go into the library where those are at. Mm -hmm. And one of the options is to view it as uh, uh, non checked in versions, I think. something. There's something back in the library settings and the advanced setting or and uh, you can say um basically claim them back like I'll, i'm taking these back i can't remember the exact link that it says there but i'll put my email in the chat oh, yep yeah feel free yeah, to well. yep yeah. reach out yeah. to me yeah, like I know it's one of those ones where it can be really challenging and there's certainly a tool for all things. I know that it's there and I know I know that we've kind of talked about it a few times when it comes to the um, community question. Shari, maybe we should put it onto our community question to answer in a video and bring us all together. We often bring together all those kind of SharePoint type questions and between Sharon Weaver, myself, Christian, and uh, uh, well, we'll we'll get answers for you, Alina. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's okay. Yeah. And and it's also sounds like a blog post. Hmm. Yeah. There you go. There we go. Um, any other questions or anyone got feedback even on that? Maybe you know. No other questions? I'm gonna look in chat just in case I've missed anything. Um Campbell saying, if the content owner is a column in site pages, you could edit in grid view in the site pages library and then republish. Grid views enables you to bulk edit fields and forms. Okay, radio might help. Uh -huh. Righto. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Appreciate you, um, as always, staying to the very end. I will see you next month and have a fabulous month. I look forward to seeing you all back and hopefully you enjoyed our speakers and I'll take the, um, I'll take the recording live as soon as possible. Hello, all. Stop recording. Amazing. Christy, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay, so I'll stop the recording if anyone's got any questions and would prefer not to be on record. <laughs>